They say there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who find themselves and those who create themselves. Are you looking for purpose or deciding it for yourself? Will you plunge waiting for someone to catch you? Or will you jump and build your wings on the way down? Seek a path or carve a path. Wait for the future or build it. What is a school but a set of walls waiting for greatness? And who are you but someone destined to achieve it? Here, between the street and the jungle, against time and tide, we push and pull just like the currents. Our ocean of dreams will meet the odds ahead and rise above it all. The University of Guam, Center for Island Sustainability, leads and supports the transition of our island region toward a sustainable future through research, education, protection and preservation, Partnerships, and inspiration. Follow us on our journey to creating a sustainable future for our island and our world. Welcome to the sixth week of the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. I'm your MC, Lauren Swadell, the Guam Green Growth Coordinator from the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability. As UOG's 11th annual conference continues, we are honored to be connecting islanders and their allies together with our very first virtual series. We have had over 1,500 logins on Zoom from over 75 countries, states, and territories, and over 10,000 views on our social media. Whether you're returning or joining in for the first time, half a day, and we're happy to connect with you. We have another amazing program for you today. It's one of my favorites, and I'm sure it's going to be one of yours. In Women Business Leaders Sustainability Solutionaries, we are giving the stage to 14 incredible women. First, we'll have opening remarks from Governor of Guam and our conference co-chair, Lou Leon Guerrero, and UOG Senior Vice President and Provost, Dr. Anita Borja Enriquez. Then, we'll have two panels that were curated and will be mo moderated by CIS 2019 keynote speaker, Amanda Ellis from Arizona State University. Our first panel will feature aggregators who promote and expand inclusion and sustainability efforts in their businesses and the businesses of others. Our second panel will feature social entrepreneurs who focus on sustainability for their environment and their communities. After that, we'll have a 30-minute virtual networking reception with Holly Rustic, the president of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce, and Vanessa Williams, attorney at law and advocate. Now, let's get started with week six. Long ago on Guam, the center of the island was mysteriously wasting away. It was soon discovered that a giant fish was eating the land. The strongest men went out to sea to search for it, but over time could not find the fish. The women gathered together to help. They cut off their hair and wove it into a large net. They sang songs to lure the giant fish out of hiding and captured it. The men helped bring in the fish for a feast. Together, they saved Guam and secured its future for generations to come. Islands are not isolated. This is just one story of island wisdom that teaches we must all work together to face the threats to our planet and our future. Join the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability as we present the theme Island Wisdom for a Global Future. Now I'd like to invite to the screen Dr. Annette Tyron Santos, Dean of the UOG School of Business and Public Administration, 
to introduce our opening speakers. Dean Santos has 25 years of combined faculty and administrator experience in higher education. As Dean of UOG School of Business and Public Administration program, she ensures the school continues to build and strengthen partnerships with private businesses, nonprofit organizations, local and U.S. federal government agencies, and professional associations in various, various disciplines. The school's impact is felt locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Welcome, Dean Santos. Buenas in half a day, Todos County. It's nice to see everyone here and tuned in. The School of Business and Public Administration plays a significant role in its teaching, research, and service mission to build a more diverse society. So across the research and business literature, female leaders are still a minority. Beyond simply describing the reality and how companies and organizations operate, we have a critical and prescriptive responsibility to help develop models to inspire the importance of working harder to spread greater awareness about sustainable solutions. Moreover, advocating that we must be active participants in this process in order to achieve them. We are fortunate to have a panel of women who have and continue to blaze the way to design programs and opportunities to achieve a more balanced cadre akin to solution-centric leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And I am excited to have the distinct pleasure to introduce two extraordinary women whose leadership is framed from their island wisdom, island-centric values of Inat Malik, to make good and to restore harmony and order, and respect, it, respect afforded, particularly to our elders, but to those in our community and those around us. These values are enduring and necessary to sustain our island way of life and serve as cornerstones for successful business models. I now have the pleasure of introducing Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, who was inaugurated as the first female governor of Guam in 2018. She is also the first Pacific Islander woman to serve as governor of a U.S. territory or state. Governor Leon Guerrero is the founding president of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce. Starting her career as a nurse at the Guam Memorial Hospital, she went on to serve five terms in the Guam legislature, focusing on legislation to improve the health delivery services of the island. After that, she took the helm as president of the Bank of Guam for 12 years, expanding the network of branches to every Micronesia sovereign state. Please give a warm welcome to Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. I just want to uh, greet you with a big half a day. And I want to thank the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce and, of course, the University of Guam for assembling this uh, distinguished group to help advance women in business on our island and not just on our island, but also in our region. We all know that when women are given the opportunity to succeed, society collectively benefit from our individual successes. And the success of women in business is integral to our Guam Green Growth, our, three, our G3 initiative, which highlights how we are all interwoven economically, environmentally, culturally, and socially, and how we need to create a circular, sustainable economy in order to survive and thrive. This initiative is also part of my goal to restore faith in Guam's future through more local food production, government, agricultural procurement, and agricultural and agricultural incubator programs. As we navigate these uncertain coronavirus times, we know that several things must change. 
Right now, we import over 90% of what we consume in Guam. Also, we generate far too much waste for our small island community. I am thrilled to see that Amanda Ellis, whom I met last year, is curating this event. Her expertise in women's economic empowerment, especially in the Pacific region, is exactly what we need to help advance this effort. Some of this work has already started. Women-owned companies like Wahan Sustainable Culture, Sustainable Sisters, and Saving Serena are providing education about home gardens and other products made from our island resources. The Guam Aquaculture Development and Training Center is under a public-private partnership and now produces shrimp for sale at the Guam Fisherman's Co-op and for export to help generate more income for our island. Our government is working on a memorandum of understanding with the Farmers Cooperative of Guam and UOG's Research Corporation to promote the sale of locally grown produce to our government agencies, grocery stores, and restaurants so that what farmers produce, they can actually sell an island. Local entrepreneurs are working on ideas for plastic recycling, making disposable plates out of local plant materials and other sustainable ventures. So our goals of creating a circular economy and promoting the growth of women in business positively and absolutely is an interest, and I am proud to see this group and advance that effort. We need to continue keeping up this great work. I just want to also say that this pandemic, um, epidemic event, which is now uh, coming to three months, only, I think, uh, provides the uh, very visible and reality of food sustainability and very visible reality of how we as islanders need to look at our own island resources to be able to generate uh, those products those commodities that provide for our well-being and our uh, sustainability and we have all seen and experienced everyone i think has experienced uh, the effects of this uh, coronavirus in terms of shelter in place, in terms of being quarantined, isolated, and in terms of uh, impacting not just on our economy, but on in our culture. And I think the more we can produce our livelihood needs within our own resources and sustain uh, our own uh, economy, well-being, uh, is very important. I, not, I now truly really understand what circular economy means. And so I just want to congratulate uh, all of you. I want to also thank the individuals and the groups that have made this uh, Zoom conference possible today. And a thank you and a big Sizuz Masi and great success uh, for what we are going to learn today. And what we learn, we need to really implement in reality and practicality and our everyday living for a greater a sustainable economy and life. Thank you, and Sizuz Masi. Sizuz Maasi, Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. Thank you, Dr. Annette. Good to see you. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Senior Vice President and Provost, Dr. Anita Borja Enriquez of the University of Guam. Dr. Enriquez preceded me as the former Dean of the School of Business and Public Administration. Her experience includes corporate planning, development management, and management consulting. She established her first business at the age of 19. Dr. Enriquez is founding vice president of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. In her career, she has focused on initiatives to strengthen Guam's business growth and development for women, the youth, veterans, and small businesses. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Anita Borja Enriquez.
introduce Masi Toromaga Haga for sharing her leadership insights and perspective on building the capacity of broader environmental sustainability in Guam. On behalf of the University of Guam, buenas and half a day, everyone. I was asked to highlight the role of Falawan, the women as inclusive leaders and entrepreneurs in achieving a sustainable future for our island and our planet. Within our unique spaces, ordinary people reaching out and coming together for a cause and a passion to make good for the sake of advancing others will yield extraordinary, extraordinary results. You will recognize in the featured sustainability solutionaries how they have exemplified doing good for their respective areas and how some have connected across the globe through their altruistic spirit. Having a homegrown grassroots perspective, I drew from the strength of my mother and our extended family system. The office of 16 children, my mother did what she needed to, to support her seven children as well as her parents and siblings. When her low paying job was not enough to sustain the family, she opened a small convenience store. A World War II survivor, she was a woman of faith and resiliency. What resonated most about her and other female elders in our family system was their altruistic spirit, exuding a strong culture of care, or as we say in Chamorro, in Adahi. This cultural value instilled a strong sense of belonging and and that my siblings and first cousins were Chetlus or brothers and sisters. In this context, absent of gender distinction, no one was better and that the other and we had to take care of each other. It is also important to note in the moral culture before Western influences, men and women were equally valued and each played significant roles to ensure the well-being of their clans. These concepts of Chetlu and Inadahi are central to our cultural heritage as reflected in our ancient Chamorro creation story. In the Marianas and throughout greater Micronesia, we are small communities where island wisdom is framed from a sense of knowing and a sense of doing. This Inadahi spirit comes with an understanding of our island's histories and that of our indigenous cultures, especially for those of you from our region who need to draw from this dearth of collective knowledge Truly embracing sustainability as ancient wisdom, noted by master navigator Larry Regatel at last week's session on Micronesian seafaring tradition. With scarce resources and the interconnectedness of our island's ecosystems, this culture of care has helped to sustain our communities for thousands of years. Within this nurturing passion, we are moved to bridge divides, to share and collaborate, and to give back and make good. This has to be the common thread in our role as women in achieving a sustainable future for our islands and our planet. The Famalawan, who you'll be hearing from today, bring passionate hearts eager to share what works and the possibilities of local adaptations. This holistic view, coupled with the spirit of Inat Dahi, is perhaps what has inspired my work at the university for the past 25 years. This sense of purpose, delivering value, and making a difference socially and economically throughout our region lends itself to the type of altruism that Inadahi spirit needed to make meaningful impact. And I've been immensely impressed with and inspired by my colleagues who have exemplified this. In viewing the role of the university in the region, we have an opportunity to build unique capacity to engage in scholarly work and solutions that are centered on island wisdom, to augment our efforts in natural resources management, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial innovations, improve social systems, and place-based economic development as part of our Parahula strategic planning efforts partnered with the Guam Green Growth Initiatives and others. Through our programs and scholarly research, we can learn more from the unique diversity and abundance of indigenous knowledge and practices in our region. In doing so, we can produce intellectual infrastructure place-based knowledge that honor knowledge and take responsibility to perpetuate indigenous wisdom. At a Palau Traditional Women's Conference I attended, a matriarch remark, focus on things that work, replicate success. On Guam, our matriarchs highlight our cultural values of Inadahi, of Chinsuli, the system of reciprocity, and the central tenet of Inafat Malik, restoring balance and harmony, which in part brings us back to sustainability as ancient wisdom. It's also part of who we are as an island people. Let's rethink who we are in terms of our cultural values and utilize them to address challenges and collectively advance the quality of life within our ecosystems. Let's connect through partnerships, listen with respect, adapt where necessary, and sustain best practices. 
building the capacity of solutionaries within our unique spaces, whether it's members of an academic, business, government, or social enterprise, is also a great strategy to shift mindsets beyond gender and closer to a truly interconnected community that exudes a culture of care. Sindagaluna Sijismasi. Cesar's Masi, Senior Vice President, Provost Dr. Enriquez. Lauren, I turn it back to you to get us started with our panel of wonderful speakers. Thank you, Governor Leon Guerrero, Dr. Enriquez, and Dr. Santos for speaking on the importance of women leadership and being such shining examples of that. In 2015, each member state of the United Nations committed to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals to put the world on a path to a more equitable, prosperous, and sustainable future. The fifth of these goals is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Improving gender equality not only addresses equity, fairness, and rights in representation, but also improves governance and economic outcomes. Further, women in leadership roles boost environmental sustainability and education and public health. Let's do a quick quiz of just a few questions to see how much we really know about women equality. First question. What percentage of countries are led by women? Now we're gonna go through these pretty quickly, so I'll, I'll end it in three seconds. Ready? Three, two, one. So, wow, everyone, uh, most people answer correctly, and it's uh, unfortunate that only seven percentage of countries are led by women. Okay, next question. What percentage of Fortune 500 companies are led by women? Six, 16, 26, or 36? Of all the 500 companies, how many are led by women? What percentage? Okay, I'll end the question now. We have nearly a tie between six and 16, and those who said six were right. Only 6% 6 6 of Fortune 500 companies are led by women. Third question. How many countries have gender equality mandated by law? Is it eight, 28, 108, or 178? I'll give you a little more time on this one because there's many countries out there and it's a lot to think about. Okay, I hope you all put in your answers. I'm gonna end the poll now. Most people answered eight, uh, eight countries and that is correct. Only eight countries have gender equality mandated by law. There might be other laws that uh, allude to some sort of equality but none that are mandated as a um, overarching law. Okay, one final question. What is the percentage of parliaments that have gender balance? Is it four, 14, 44, or 54? I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. And four is the correct answer. Only 4% of parliaments have a gender balance. Now, I hope you notice the theme here that we have pretty low numbers and we need to work to get those numbers up. Thanks for participating in the quiz. We'll learn more about the importance of women leadership throughout today's program. Now, I'd like to introduce the curator and moderator of today's conference session, Amanda Ellis. Amanda was our keynote speaker last year here in Guam, and I know is thrilled to be back with us virtually. Amanda is the Director of Global Partnerships for the Global Futures Laboratory and the Executive Director for Hawaii and Asia Pacific for the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University. Amanda is the co-chair of the We Empower United Nations SDG Challenge, an annual global competition for women entrepreneurs whose businesses are supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goals, launched by the UN Secretary General and the World Bank President in 2018. Before joining the Wrigley Institute, Amanda was New Zealand's ambassador to the 
United Nations in Geneva during the negotiations for the UN SDGs, and prior to that was the first woman to run NZ Aid, New Zealand's development agency. She previously held senior roles at the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, and Westpac Banking Corporation. The author of two best-selling Random House books on women in business and five research titles on gender and growth in the World Bank direction, Directions and Development series, Amanda is a founding member of the Financial Alliance for Women, recipient of the TIAW Lifetime Achievement Award for Services to Women's Economic Empowerment, and the East West Center's Distinguished Alumni Award. Aloha and kia ora. and thank you so much, Lauren. Just incredibly inspiring to hear from Governor Leon Guerrero and from UOG Senior Vice President and Provost Enrique. This is an incredible session of Women Sustainability Solutionaries, and the governor said so brilliantly when she mentioned when women are given the opportunity to succeed, we all benefit. It couldn't be more true and I think in this incredible series where we're really looking to island wisdom for a global future and looking at all of the ways in which the women who will share with you their solutions can help create a multiplier impact for good. So we have women here from across the Pacific and beyond today. And we're going to start with a very short video to put women's leadership in context. I'm so impressed with your poll results by the way everybody excellent work but we're just going to play a minute of a short video that's been done with the united nations and uh, the the world bank the council of women world leaders and others in 2015 every united nations member state made the commitment to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership this builds on previous international commitments, like the 1995 Beijing Platform for Action. The rationale is not just equity, fairness and rights and representation, but also because it makes for stronger governance and better economic outcomes. The diversity dividend is well documented. In the private sector, more women in senior managerial positions and on boards correlates with an increased return on investment. In governance bodies, gender balance correlates with increased emphasis on long-term growth drivers like environmental sustainability, education and health. So with such a strong case for gender balance, what's the current state of play? One in four parliamentarians is now female. Only one in five speakers of parliament or government ministers is a woman. And less than 7% of country leaders are women. In the private sector, almost one third of companies globally have no women at all in board positions. A new index provides some insight. In a survey of 10,000 respondents in 2019, more than half expressed discomfort with women as leaders in both corporate and political life. So with progress this slow and challenges persisting, what works? Thank you so much, Austin. I think that gives us a real insight into why I was so impressed and delighted to come to Guam last year and discover the highest percentage of women leaders in government, not only of any island, but of any jurisdiction internationally. So congratulations, Guam, you are world leaders. Now, Provost UK mentioned the indigenous concept of restoring balance and harmony. And I just want to take a moment at this very difficult time to remind us of the importance of social equity and of addressing systemic discrimination in all its forms. We, of course, are going to be focusing on gender discrimination today, but I did want to take a moment and recognize the trauma is 
taking place across much of America. So, to a positive note now, we know that research has shown the multiplier impact of women's leadership on sustainability. You saw that in the video. And in fact, policy revealed in a new research study earlier this year that women leaders are actually 73% more likely to focus on sustainability issues. We heard earlier in this series from Senator Amanda Shelton, who led the bill to create Guam's 100% renewable energy commitment by 2045. We had that in Hawaii too, so exciting to see that. And of course, the governor is enacting Guam's green growth agenda, as we saw in the early video. So I am just thrilled to be able to introduce our first panel of women leaders who are aggregators, promoting a positive multiplier impact for others with a real focus on sustainability and inclusion. So I would love to see if we could just showcase our panelists before I introduce each one individually. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You. So our first speaker, Maria Eugenia Leon Guerrero, is the COO, the Chief Operating Officer for the Bank of Guam, and the bank's most senior woman. We know access to capital and financial services are absolutely critical for business growth. And yet, financial institutions are notoriously male-oriented. A study by McKinsey estimated that between 12 and $28 trillion could be added to the global economy by 2025 just by eliminating gender discrimination and allowing women the same access to economic activity as men. So, Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. Tell us about how the Bank of Guam can help promote business development that is both inclusive and sustainable for the island? Thank you, Amanda, um, for that question. Um, hope everybody can hear me. Before I answer, I just want to very quickly thank the university and say that I'm extremely honored to take part in this conference alongside all of these very accomplished and very impressive women. So Amanda, getting back to your question, I completely agree that financial institutions tend to be male dominated. I will say there are a lot of women in banking, but I find that they're mostly concentrated in the areas of retail banking, operations, marketing, human resources. But if you look at, of course, the top executive positions, the boards of directors, chief lending officers, chief credit officers, it's overwhelmingly men. Um, I think Bank of Guam has been extremely fortunate and very unique that we have had a strong female leader as our previous CEO. And of course, during her time at the bank, Governor Liu really did so much to advocate for women in business. And now that she has moved on to a higher calling, it's really up to us, the new leadership, to carry on that legacy. So in thinking of the question, I think that there are three things that the bank can do to promote business development that is both inclusive and sustainable. And the first thing is to define the specific outcomes that we are looking to achieve and start measuring the data. So for example, are we looking to increase the percentage of our loan portfolio that is with women entrepreneurs, the number of relationships, products per relationship? I think we would really just need to sit down and decide 
what does success look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? And then once we have decided that, start measuring the data. The second thing we can do is to integrate diversity and inclusion values into our sales team and into our sales culture. So what do I mean by that? Making sure that women are adequately represented on our business development team. Uh, making sure that sales goals are tied to higher level enterprise goals around diversity and inclusion. And lastly, I think a very important thing that we need to do is to strengthen partnerships with key stakeholders. And I think that this is something that the bank has been very successful at doing. So continuing to partner with, with wonderful organizations such as the Guam Women's Chamber, the university, and even other local financial institutions as we all work together towards that common goal of empowering women in business. As an example, the bank already does a quarterly economic forum, an annual small business forum. Perhaps we can partner with everyone to put together more intimate workshops specifically tar targeted to women entrepreneurs. Perhaps we can explore uh, loan guarantee programs that are, that are targeted to women, things of that nature. So to recap, the three things, data, sales culture, and partnership. Um, and in closing, diversity does not ha happen by accident. If we want to achieve it, we're going to need a very deliberate strategy, commitment from the top, and alignment throughout. Very wise words. Thank you, Maria. And that point about diversity is very well made. There's good longitudinal data now that shows that the diversity dividend is actually an addition to the bottom line. So it's not only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do from a business sense. We move now to Merilani James from Hawaii, who is the co-founder of Mana Up. And Meli, you are a super successful serial entrepreneur turned aggregator. Uh, on the cutting edge of tech, you were co-owner of the world's most successful wine app. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Before returning to your native Hawaii to promote and manage business accelerators to help grow entrepreneurs locally. And I know you've been involved in a number, but your most recent venture, Mana Up, is providing a whole ecosystem of support for local Hawaiian companies. I would love it if you could share more about Mana Up and also tell us how you have been helping local businesses to pivot through COVID. As we speak, I'm looking at one of your wonderful Mana Up gift baskets on our dining room table. Great, well, thanks, Amanda. And I wanna thank um, the University of Guam. I got to visit about two years ago and work with Annette, Anita, and the whole gang um, over in the Entrepreneurship Center. So thank you all for having me today. Um, so yes, Mana Up, we are an initiative to help grow local products to markets around the world that capture the authentic people, culture, and resources of Hawaii. Hawaii is very similar to Guam in the sense that you know, we've got very high cost of living, um, even for our own, you know, for the 51 states, uh, lowest exports per capita, and we're one of 10 states that continues to lose our local population, um, mainly because of a deficit and what it costs to live there as opposed to um, what people are actually making. And so really looking at when we started Mana Up, how could we double down and tap into our unfair advantages, our regional strengths, and looking at the brand of Hawaii and looking at amazing products that have always been kind of our best kept secrets. Uh, but how do we help them scale to global markets, increase exports, increase our G GDP um, in exports and really bringing in new dollars into the state. And so we launched about uh, two and a half years ago. We just announced our fifth cohort. So we now have 51 companies um, in our portfolio. I'm really happy to share that 31 of those 51 companies are female CEOs, uh, which is pretty incredible when we looked at some of those devastating stats that we did the, the polls on earlier. Um, and we, we actually go and pick the best entrepreneurs who are executing um, and are amazingly doing what, they, what they're doing. Um, obviously, we can tell if a woman is a man or woman, but uh, we have a lot of diversity in addition to male and female. We've got 22 native Hawaiian founders and 17 family-run businesses. But again, we pick the best entrepreneurs. They just happen to be incredibly diverse, especially in this uh, arena. So what we've done um, launching Cohort 5, especially during COVID, is looking at our companies, um, especially in the, in the portfolio prior, 
who's doing well right now and looking at direct to consumer e-commerce are really the ones that are have more of a presence online are faring much better than the ones that were relying much of their revenue streams on retail especially in the tourist areas and so not only um, do we believe direct to consumer is um, more around future proofing our business and not just about right now um, that revenue stream is absolutely an area that we need to double down on even regardless of how long it takes tourists to come tourism to come back um, but looking at you know, connection to culture, authenticity, and some of these more global trends happening, especially with millennials, that, that's very important. And really taking this time now for storytelling and helping consumers all over the world um, get to know the founders, get to know the companies and help them share their stories. Thanks, Amanda. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'm hoping we'll have time to come back for another round, but I'm, a, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So my fellow Kiwi, Megan Falone, is our final... Oh, uh, sorry, I had jumped. No, Amy. I am delighted by Amy Christensen, who is a global sustainability legend to share with us. Amy has advised Google and the World Bank, among many others, and recently founded the Sun Valley Forum to promote both local uh, sustainable and regenerative solutions to scale. She has an annual event which features the who's who and last year included a panel on islands that the Guam Centre for Island Sustainability Director Austin Shelton and I were both de delighted to participate in. So Amy, tell us about your model and why even though you're based in Idaho, you think that island wisdom matters for a global future. Thank you, Amanda. It's so wonderful to be with all of you. And thank you to Austin and the whole team for inviting me to be part of this. So Island Wisdom, I think, is um, it's really a journey that I've taken, and it's about place. Um, I've, I have worked most of my career globally on global scalable solutions for impacts on climate, clean energy, and sustainable development. And I moved home 10 years ago and found myself in a small community in central Idaho, very isolated. And although we're not technically an island, it often feels like that. And I think that what we have in common and what I've learned in my community about our need for resilience is a a deep need for local self-reliance. And I think islands are the places where you all have known this forever. Um, and the dangers of relying on outside uh, resources and not being locally self-reliant. And so in our community, we have seen this head on with drought and fires uh, and other challenges we face over years and we're facing increasingly with climate change impacts. And so we founded the Sun Valley Institute, a center for resilience to localize our food system, localize our energy system and become much more self-reliant so that when disasters happen, we're more resilient. And in this time of the pandemic, our food system has been interrupted and we are so fortunate that we have regional growers with whom we've been working to support with storage and processing and other facilities so that they can supply our communities here in Idaho and not just export to the global markets. Um, but it also diversifies our economy. We're a, a tourism-based economy. And when we have farmers and food growers and we have energy developers mm -hmm. and workers in solar, it diversifies our, our local economy. So for us, this strategy of local self-reliance has been not just about security, it's been beneficial to our environment because we're relying on our local renewable energy, on local food growing, which is so much better for our local environment and for job creation than a traditional industrialized food system. Um, it, so it's had all of these multiple benefits. Um, at the same time, we felt that we needed to um, learn from the wider community. So we founded the Sun Valley Forum, which is a global event that we host every year. And thank you, Amanda and Austin, for joining us. We, there we work to showcase innovators, including from islands, who are piloting the strategies that will uh, guide us in building a more sustainable world. So I find that it's the Hawaii Green Growth Team and others who are in islands who are finding the most effective solutions where they can pilot them and innovate and we can all learn from them. And so um, my experience is that island wisdom has been vital to our community and communities around the world. I think this pandemic has woken all of us up to how much we need to be much more locally self-reliant and build community and connection to support each other. Um, 
we've been uh, running a local recovery committee for our county in the wake of this pandemic. Our county had the highest rate of infection of anywhere in the United States before New York City overtook us. Because we're a tourism-based economy, people were coming in, coming out right before it hit. And so our community, we had, an, so that was another threat to us. And so we created a recovery committee and we've been, um, identifying our needs and gaps and using our scarce resources to fill those needs. And so crisis for us has turned into another opportunity. Uh, with climate risk, we created an institute for resilience and realized we need to localize our food system and our energy system and diversify our economy to not just rely on tourism and skiing in a time where skiing is going away. Um, with the pandemic, we realized we needed to optimize our resources in a small community and collaborate together. And what it's doing is it's teaching us to um, think about the future, to build back better. So now we're looking at how do we invest in a better uh, more strategic future for for our region and alongside islands uh, share our strategies and learn from each other and help scale them up so I'll just close with um, the forum that we host globally is an opportunity to showcase innovative solutions just like this one is so showcase those innovators but also surround them with the partners and the investors alongside of them. I'm so excited that this year, um, this summer, we're focusing on two big solutions, one in regenerative agriculture, which is an exciting new way to do better agriculture. And another one is scaling up an island-based solution that came from Australia, which is Aboriginal fire management and land management from the Aboriginal communities in Australia. And how can we learn from those indigenous knowledge, knowledge from those communities and bring them out to South Australia from North Australia where they had the huge fires, but also there are 29 countries around the world who have similar lands who can learn from these Aboriginal fire management solutions. So our job is to help match them with partners and investors and others at the event, uh, which will be virtual this year. Um, and so I feel that, um, you know, we're building a little island community through the forum and um, continuing to learn from um, our, our fellow island innovators, whether there are islands in actual physical uh, or in communities. So thank you so much. I'm happy to, I look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. I love that idea of turning crisis into opportunity to build back better and really think about self-reliance. And uh, it's wonderful to know that there's a little island out there in mm -hmm. the middle of Idaho. I am thrilled now to pick up on a couple of the comments that uh, Governor Guerrero made about food security and also energy and why energy self-sufficiency is so important for islands. And I first wanted to give a real shout out to my fellow Kiwi, Megan Fallon, who is currently in Switzerland. So it is around, uh, around 1.45 in the morning for her. So thank you so much for joining us, Megan. Megan is a social innovator and the CEO of Barefoot College International, which helps to promote solar solutions at the village level through training illiterate and semi-literate women, dubbed Solar Mamas. So this inspirational multiplier model has been re recognized by the United Nations as one of the top 20 solutions for the Sustainable Development Goals. And we know there are incredible examples all over the world in, I think now, 193 countries, including across the Pacific, in Micronesia, in Fiji, and in Vanuatu. So Megan, over to you, and I think you wanted to show a very brief video too. Uh, I have to say a big shout out to my fellow Hillary Laureate, Amy Christensen, and what an honor to, to follow her. Thank you, Amanda, for those kind words. Hapa ade and kia ora, everybody. Um, the Solar Mamas are a remarkable story, and in the Pacific, they have had a quite extraordinary uh, impact and will, I hope, continue to do so as we expand and grow that program right now with help from the government of India, the government of Fiji, and several other governments across the Pacific. We're currently expanding the program into 14 uh, Pacific Islands. It's, as far as I know, the single largest government-backed program to address rural electrification in the poorest communities within the Pacific Islands. And um, I think the, what, the thing that's so extraordinary right now is that um, Barefoot has always believed for nearly 50 years as a Gandhian organization in the wisdom, 
knowledge and skills that, that very poor communities already have, that indigenous communities already possess. And we have really built a high technology program on this sense of localized wisdom and placed it in the hands of women in a way that allows them to level the playing field on issues like gender and allows them to have a voice in both their financial well-being as well as their community decisions as well as their their household decisions and by really looking at how do we skill women um, women who might not have had very much formal education in ways that brings competence, confidence, and self-belief in themselves, but maybe not a certificate. So really widening our view of education that's much more inclusive, that, that leaves a space for traditional and indigenous wisdom to really blend with technology, digital technology, renewable energy technology, in order that women can facilitate that self-sufficiency for their communities. Really looking across the, the Pacific at how um, this kind of mindset allows uh, women to really leapfrog, to play a, a very strong role in uh, resilience building and adaptation, both on climate and on aggregated livelihoods. Part of this program uh, has worked very strongly in the last five years to develop a co-curriculum called Enrich that works on developing women's critical thinking skills, allows them to become micro entrepreneurs to lead and to lead other women through the process of building sustainable livelihoods for themselves and for others. Um, and so I think the best way to show what it means and what it looks like to transform a woman is to show you this really short clip of one of our Tonga mamas graduating at the end of six months, having been in India, um, and talking about her journey. <laughs> Today is very important and unforgettable for me and my co-training from the Kingdom of Tonga. We're coming to the end of this training. My heart is full of happiness. Why I'm happy? because I am full. I came here with a nothing, an empty basket. But today, I have to take back to my home island. A basket is full, full of knowledge, full of experience and skills. And I will come back with the title, I am a solar engineer. And so you will all get to meet one of my extraordinary uh, solar engineers, Benny, in the next panel. Uh, and I look forward to you hearing from her and her journey after Barefoot. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Megan. And I just love that my basket is full. And I'm feeling mine is very full, listening to all you incredible women. In the interest of time, we are not going to do a second round just yet. So I'm hoping that you can remain with us and we will do the second round all together after our next panel of women leaders who are social entrepreneurs uh, setting a standard through sustainable business. And I am now going to transition immediately to one of Megan's solar entrepreneurs, Elivani Vumani Baiki from Fiji, or have I got the order wrong, Austin? I'll show everybody's videos first. Apologies.
Awesome, thank awesome. you so thank much. You. Just testing to see if we have Ilivani online from Lautoka, Fiji. Did the connection work? Ah, oh, here she is, Ilivani. <laughs> Welcome, Bula. <laughs> Lovely to have you. Bula, everyone. Bula, everyone. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to be part of this uh, meeting today. Thank you all for uh, having me today. So Ilivani, tell us about your experience as a solar engineer on the ground in Fiji. Thank you, Amanda. My experience as a solar mama in Lotoka uh, is a networking with stakeholders in raising awareness and engaging with key actors in communities and relevant women groups who are the main benefic beneficiaries of solar powered projects and other livelihood that is directly and indirectly to solar projects. Furthermore, such income generating projects such as beekeeping and producing uh, virgin coconut oil, which is currently the project that I am engaging in as a source of livelihood for my host household. Solar power is so important in my community because it does not require monetary obligations like paying bills. And the most important thing is that it is free energy source. In my view and the experience of solar project elevated the socioeconomic viability of the woman in their capacity with the household. This contributes to the ripple effect of raising their livelihood and ease of household everyday activities. From a business perspective, solar powered battery provide, provide long, longevity and continuity in networking and marketing, which is the hallmark of business operation as a whole. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm going to be asking everybody at the end to leave the audience with the one thing that they would like everyone who's attending to do as a practical takeaway. So please be thinking about that. And I'm now delighted to transition to Bryn Foster from Hawaii, who uses solar technology to transform canoe plants like ulu and taro into flower, flowers for her voyaging foods business. And I know, Bren, that you're working on models to share that solar facility with the local community through partnerships and through your role as the president of the Hawaii Farmers Union North Shore chapter. Great to see a woman in that role. And I know too that you're both Native Hawaiian and also your mother's family traces ancestry to the uh, Powhatan people on the mainland. So I know how strongly you feel about indigenous island wisdom for both sustainable futures and healthy lifestyles. I know too that your business has some fascinating origins. So please tell us more about those. Thank you so much. Aloha, everybody. Thank you, Amanda, for that kind introduction. And I am very excited about Solar Mamas. I really hope we can connect after because we need some Solar Mamas in Hawaii as well. So I'm excited to learn from you. Um, I, uh, my name is Bryn Foster, and as a first-generation farm enthusiast, I have been working to understand the barriers to entry in both the farming and the value-added manufacturing industry in Hawaii. So I decided to co-develop a prototype solar dryer that would be open source for our farmers in Hawaii. A lot of solar dryers, there's a lot of them, but they seem to have either patents on production. And we really wanted this to be uh, you know, owned by our own people to not have to have any more royalties or patents or any of these sort of things. Um, so this dryer would utilize clean energy for an off the grid initial stage drying system for value added products in Hawaii and it would provide an opportunity for our local farmers, processors, and community organizations to build capacity and develop products in response to unmet market demand, which is in our canoe plant flower. So being aware of the need and the challenges in food security and access is really how I got started on this journey is to focus on a value added industry, making flour from our Hawaiian canoe plants, such as ulu, breadfruit, kalo, which is taro, and uala, sweet potato, since the flower extends the harvest from uh, our farmers and it also, we often use grade B or C or even food that would be wasted. Um, and so this really spoke to me. But how I started Voyaging Foods was really based on a need to find a better for you gluten-free teething biscuit. 
uh, there really wasn't anything out there in 2005 when I started without refined sugars. It was all imported wheat. Um, in Hawaii, we import over 90% of our food, and I wanted to be part of the solution. So I decided to make my own uh, teething biscuit, and I started with making taro powder from sour poi that was um, a lot of people, I guess younger people, didn't really like the taste of sour poi. So it was being discarded. So I really wanted to um, save that. And so I decided to make flour from that poi and make a cookie from it. So I dried the poi in my oven and I made a flour for cookies and teething biscuits. And um, then I caught my mom eating all the off casts. So I thought I should really make a cookie for everybody and not just for babies. Uh, and now I understand that I was really being divinely led by my ancestors to find a way back to our cultural foods through that teething biscuit. And I was led on a journey that keeps unfolding to this day. I went from learning about the history of Kahlo to planting it into my home and now understanding that biodiversity in plants such as Kahlo is a form of climate mitigation. Um, and so part of starting this company was I really wanted to make sure that we only sourced Hawaiian varieties of taro for our products and to highlight that. And our vision is a food sovereign Hawaii um, and Polynesia, where all 80 to 100 varieties of, of kalo are represented in specialized regions, are grown in homes, and are served in daily meals. So I love kalo because it was like a light went on for me when I started eating and planting it. Um, I really realized that uh, the interconnection between land and people became so much more clear. And I'm also interested in other indigenous people's creation stories and that their sacred seeds are ones that we all need to protect and to understand that Haloa and Kalo is part of our native Hawaiian creation story is really extra special to me. So I um, thank you for having me and I look forward to collaborating with all of you. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think that is such a great model for all islands. And I can tell everybody firsthand that your products are absolutely delicious. So it's now my great honor to introduce another fellow Kiwi, Brianne West, who is the CEO and founder of Ethique, which means ethical in French. And Brianne literally started her business to address the problem of plastic waste. She has this incredible statistic of something like 100 million plastic bottles being thrown away from just shampoo and conditioner bottles and was determined that she was going to do something about it. So Brianne, tell us all about how you created Ethique and how you've gone from making these bars for soap and conditioner to a full scale zero waste cosmetics business with a $13 million turnover in such a short time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to join you in, in uh, the stories you guys have been telling are pretty incredible. Um, the statistic you're referencing is, is a bit worse than you've, you stated, Amanda. It's uh, 80 <gasps> billion plastic <gasps> bottles are used every year globally and 9% are recycled on average. Um, so the plastic you use, you've, you've ever used really, is still among us in some way or form. Or shape. So this, this is something I knew um, a few years ago and I desperately wanted to create a company that not only had a positive environmental impact but also operated in a way that I believe companies should which is that everyone who was impacted in some way by the company is brought along and, and succeeds alongside it. Um, so when I say the tea rids the world of plastic bottles, it's because we produce bars instead of bottles. And that's not to say it's just soap, it's literally like exactly what you'd get in a bottle, but just with the water removed. Because what sense does it make to fill a product with uh, 90 to 95% water, package it in plastic, and then ship that product, which is heavy because of all that water, around the world, and then use it in a room full of water? That is completely illogical. And that was simply the basis behind a tea. And like Amanda says, we've now grown um, pretty rapidly, we export to 16 countries out of New Zealand still, and um, it's been a pretty incredible ride full of numerous challenges. But the exciting bit is the values haven't changed. So it began as a way to rid the world of plastic bottles. And looking back, it was a little bit naive, but I think the best ideas probably are slightly naive ones. Um, but it, it's the way of operating. So um, uh, one of my wonderful, wonderful uh, friends who I haven't actually spoken to in a while, Andy, is, is on next. Um, and, and her and her team supply 
um, our, our coconut oil from Samoa, from her Women's Cooperative Women in Business Development, which I won't tell you anything about because I don't want to steal any of her thunder at all. Um, but we work with our, our direct trade partners um, as much as possible. So we try and work with women's cooperatives around the world. Um, for example, we get Moringa oil from Rwanda. Um, it's those types of relationships that I really think the cosmetics industry really needs to tidy up. It's not just the product, it's how we source that product. It's, it's who we are at the end of the day, who we are empowering by what we produce. And unfortunately, the cosmetics industry is pretty hideous in terms of supply chain and waste. Um, and cocoa butter would be a really a good example. If you know anything about the cocoa butter supply chain, um, it's full of child labor, child trafficking. It is just, um, it's pretty awful. So we also make sure we work directly with fair trade producers there, a women's cooperative. Um, and we've just since switched to a new one in Ghana. So it's a really nice way to, to ensure that the, not only the product we produce is zero waste and genuinely makes an impact. And we have thus far saved 8 million plastic bottles from being made and disposed of, which is great, but the goal is 50 million by 2025. Um, but also that everything we do throughout our entire business is as ethical as possible. We bring everyone along. We've got 352 shareholders who invested in us at the very, very beginning um, as we did equity crowdfunding to fund the company. We didn't go the, the VC, the typical route. Um, and, you know, we get to bring them along with us in uh, success and hopefully change a whole lot of people's lives and change the way people look at business as instead of this big ball of, of evil, as so many people think it is, as something that will, is a phenomenal cause of change. And I believe business is the biggest driver of positive change quicker than a lot of um, other routes, certainly government, in my opinion. Could not agree more. Business is the biggest driver for positive change. Wonderful. And love the connection that happened between you and Andy, which is so exciting. And I can see there's all sorts of incredible connections that are going to come out of today's event as well. So, Andy, we are thrilled to be able to welcome you today. You were a social entrepreneur way back before the term was fashionable. And I was thrilled to be able to work with you when I ran the New Zealand Development Agency. And then so thrilled to discover that you and Brianne were working together. Now, you also pulled off the miracle of, I think, the, the largest single global contract for virgin coconut oil to the body shop with your network of women and youth entrepreneurs across many islands. So tell us a little bit about the origins of WIBDI and then the way in which you've been able to develop sustainable business in Samoa. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's so good to see you. <clears throat> Missed you on our part outside of the Pacific, but we're thrilled that you haven't forgotten us and that you continue to support and champion our work Take us out of our comfort zone. You do that very well. And I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, be here with Brianne. Her organization is just amazing. And if I can say congratulations, I won't say what for, to Brianne and Brie. And gosh, I'm excited. I want to try Brie's biscuits. But yes, the body shop really took our small NGO out of our comfort zone. And I'm pleased to say that over 13 years later, small farming families are organically certified to international standards and still sole suppliers of organically certified virgin coconut oil to the body shop, to the community fair trade program, because as you know, the body shop has been sold and resold um, a few times. They've still kept the, the community fair trade program. And even more excited that we're suppliers to Ethique and we love working with um, Brienne. We love telling everyone about her uh, product and she's even come here and visited us, which is just amazing and we want to do more with her. Um, we work with other Pacific Island countries. Um, we share our learning. We think that's really, really important. And because we believe that small island countries need to work together, we all grow the same things, but when we're smaller, we grow these things in small quantities and we should be sharing our markets. That's a big dream. Our rural isolated communities need to be part of the cash economy on their own steam and they need to get support to bring their products to the marketplace. You know, we are 
agriculture-based our economies, most of our island countries, if not all. And we have many exciting plants that grow in our countries, which we've used for generations for foods and for medicine. And these plants are now what we use to earn an income. And we know that now we live in a cash economy, but we're so far away from markets and we can't live forever on remittances to drive our small rural economies. So for us at Women in Business, we've, we've worked over two decades to um, drive these economies and make, you know, have them driven by the people themselves from their villages. We take them to the markets. We create opportunities along the value chain so that they're involved as much as possible in this value chain and they're not just earning at the farm gate, which is a lot smaller than what they earn if we take them along. If we together can produce low volume, high value products and export them to international markets together, I think it would really, really help us. And, and there's just so many exciting things that uh, I've actually heard on this um, on our conference. And we're so blessed to have markets like the Body Shop, like Ethique, and we have another, another amazing uh, company in Brienne's um, city, Christchurch, C1 Espresso. You know, they believe in sustainable sourcing and social responsibility, and we really should be working together. And now with COVID-19, we don't really understand what's happening. The other thing we rely on in our small countries is tourism. And um, those markets are a loss. So, you know, we should be looking more at um, virtual markets and, and, you know, things like that. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And thank you so much, Amanda. So good to see you. Oh, thank you, Andy. It's wonderful to see you too. And we have some questions coming in. So I'm going to throw these out. Uh, Kyle Dahleg is asking, is the key to business practices boosting many small businesses or forcing already big companies to change their ways? So please, panelists, just raise your hand and unmute yourself and provide your response. Could you just repeat the um, question, please, Amanda? The question is, is the key to ethical business practices boosting many small businesses like the ones we've heard about today or forcing already big companies and i guess unilever is a good example and the companies that have signed up to the science-based targets initiatives for example to reduce their carbon footprint to helping big companies change their ways so any any of you who would like to comment on that question is it an either or I think it's both. So I think a combination of both are necessary. So small businesses typically force larger ones because they take their market share because consumers are rapidly becoming more educated. They want better products. They want to know where they come from. They want to know who was harmed by producing that product. They want to know what happens to the environment when that product is produced. Um, so small businesses can answer those easier because it is easier to build a business with sustainability at its core than it is to change a huge corporate. And, and I understand that. But then those businesses, those larger businesses realize, oh, we can't keep doing what we're doing because we're losing market share. And that is happening right now. So these small businesses are being snapped up and acquired by these big companies. And unfortunately, they may, they may, may or not um, lose some of those values. Uh, but I believe the way you change is by creating new businesses and forcing those bigger ones to change because they're not going to change just because they feel that's the right thing to do. Well, that'll be a slower way to change if that does happen. The combination. Brian, I know that it's a B Corp, and I'm going to then move to Megan and then to Andy. Tell us a little bit about what it takes to be a B Corp and how that differentiates you from a, a solely for profit company. Um, B Corp is you don't have to social enterprise you know it's it's it's, it's a I guess it's a complicated term um it shouldn't be really it's simply a business that is is out for more than profit and i guess that's what a b corp is so the b corp certification uh, assesses your whole company whether it's how you treat your customers to who owns you to who's on your board to what your product does again to the environment it assesses everything it's a big it's an overwhelming document when you first look at it um but it gives you this really beautiful 
score as to how you're doing against best practice. It's something I really recommend every business does, even if you don't want to, um, to become a B Corp for whatever reason, or if you can't because you're not quite there yet, it's a really quite great way to assess yourself against that. I uh, highly recommend that look into it and support B Corps because it is harder to be an ethical business. It is more expensive and you do get, it is, a, it is a lot harder and a lot of investors still don't understand why you'd want to do these things. So it is harder and we should definitely support ethical businesses. Thank you, Brian. Now over to Megan. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to pick up on that because I think it's actually quite a, a fundamental issue right now. I think our whole lens through which we see uh, economic models and businesses and the way we define those is at a point of no return. And I think the future that we are looking at coming out of this COVID period is one in which it will just no longer be acceptable to do business as usual. Whether you're a small business or a larger business, um, the principles of building value into your supply chain from bottom to top and empowering people all the way through that has now got to be part of every business model. Um, and yes, that will mean some sacrifices, but you have some real leaders coming out right now. Ikea, for instance, in India is no longer buying from any middlemen. They're only buying from producer, uh, user, producer uh, groups themselves. And I think this move by corporates to be able to really deal directly with smaller groups of entrepreneurs uh, at grassroots level is a very healthy sign and one that will be replicated uh, by others eventually. And that's sort of where those two things converge. Fantastic. And I think it's interesting too to see the Davos Declaration uh, in January this year and then the Business Roundtable 200 last year, all saying that they were shifting from shareholder, which in the US has been an obsession with making money and profit at any cost, yeah. to stakeholder, which is a really big shift if, uh, if we can make it fast enough, given, given that we know that COVID-19 is only a fire drill for climate change. Yeah. Andy, over to you for the final word. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you, Amanda. Um, just thinking again, we can't do without ethical business. And uh, the problem with um, corporates is that, again, we live on small island countries. And we are now in Samoa and Tonga, and I'm sure a few other countries, actually um, have, you know, are competing. We've got corporates coming in here and competing for our products. And the sad thing is that they've they have all the um, resources so they can just take over what we've spent years to put together. And um, being ethical, it's just, I guess, everybody needs to be a B Corp company and, um, you know, be able to do the right thing. Thank you. And that is a wonderful note on which to wrap up and then ask each of you to leave the audience with the one thing you would like everybody to do as a takeaway today. And I'm going to go in the order in which you spoke. So we will begin with Maria and end with Andy. So Maria, the one thing that you would like everyone to do. So I think, um, you know, kind of going back to what you were mentioning, how uh, Fortune 500 companies, banks are male dominated. I really um, benefited from having positive female role models to kind of give me that confidence. And I think that access to, to mentors, to subject matter experts is so important to empower women who are looking to get in business and get a leg up. And so my takeaway to everyone is if you are in a position to be a mentor, be one, make time in your life um, for that. And then if you need a mentor, if you're stuck and you need some inspiration, reach out to someone who you admire and, and connect with them and absorb whatever knowledge that you can from them. And we're really just here to help each other. So that would be my takeaway is be a mentor or get a mentor. Wonderful. And my takeaway for you would be have a little look at the Financial Alliance for Women because I think it might be an interesting organization for Bank of Guam to join and contribute to. Yes, Mally. I've been looking at that. Thank you. Amy. 
Hi, Amanda. So there's a wonderful question in the chat that's related to my take my leave leave behind, which is um, he was asking about helping local farmers to become USDA approved because the federal government hinders like livestock farmers. And here in Idaho, we we are the same way. You have this live transport to some big USDA certified processing facility. And so it really doesn't support the local food economy. And so my my leave behind is and, and we're working, by the way, on a regional uh, food uh, meat processing facility. So I'm happy to share more with Gerald, who asked the question about that. But um, I think what, what we're eating, but also, to, so ask everyone to think about not just what we're eating, but how and where it was grown and, and created for us and who did that. And just, con I feel like we eat at least three times a day and it's, the number one thing I think we can do in changing our world and for our environment, for the people who are growing our food, who now are in so much danger due to the pandemic. So that's my, my leave behind. Great. Thank you. Buy and eat local. And Megan still in Switzerland. I hope. Sure. <laughs> Two takeaways I will leave you with Amanda and all the other wonderful women who we've had a chance to meet this evening, this morning. Um, the first one is, I think we're living in a moment where everything we do or touch has to feel regenerative. Um, every way we look at our business, we think about decisions day to day. Are we building something better? Are we making something that will grow? Are we putting value in? instead of taking value out. And then my second one is give away power. Every chance you get, because that's how we spread power is to give it away. And so uh, the more women who can become empowered through us and by us and with us, uh, the better off we will all be. Wonderful, and giving away power is a beautiful segue to our solar engineer. Elivani, can you still hear us? Is the connection okay? If you can, we would love to see your beautiful face again and hear from you. Looks, oh, great. You might be Thank muted. You. For me, the most important thing is to, is to reach out to other communities who really need a solar lighting system right now. And therefore, to summarize, uh, su such technology empowers the woman in sustainable livelihood with mi minimal, minimum operating cost and at the same token, utilize the abundant available energy provided by the sun. Vinaka, Amanda. Vinaka, wonderful. Yes, help other communities with solar livelihoods. Fantastic. Bryn, on to you. Closing words. I would like to leave the audience um, to commit to be curious and open um, to your place-based food where you are in your area and to incorporate these into your meals. Indigenous seeds and plants support local tribes, they support local groups and businesses, and they mitigate climate change. So I'm just gonna leave some of my favorite um, indigenous seed, um, sacred seed savers on my Facebook page and my Instagram page. So just sharing um, friends pages. Lovely. Thank you so much. And everybody buy Voyaging Foods products. They are totally delicious. Brianne, whose products I use exclusively since I discovered them. And it's so wonderful to know that they are told I can plant the boxes. No waste. <laughs> um, I, I think my echoing what everyone has so far said, but absolutely think about what it is you buy. Um, I, ideally, if you can give up single use plastic, fabulous, but it does, it extends beyond that. So if you are in a position to think about what it is you buy and A, do you really need it? Do you really need to buy it? Because 45% of our global climate change emissions come from stuff. Imagine if we get half that, because 50% of the things that we buy online are in the bin within 32 days days you didn't need it right you didn't need it right um, um all i'm saying is think about what it is you're buying do you really need it and of course give up the bottle and embrace the bar <laughs> <laughs> thank you brian andy final final words i like what brian just said but we live on 
small island countries, most of us. And I just, and there's so many amazing ideas have come out just out of just this small uh, conference that we're having. And I'd like us to reach out, reach out to each other, to share ideas. And um, that's the way we're going to grow and, and move forward and become part of our global economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. That's the perfect note on which to end because as we transition to our virtual reception, there are another couple of amazing women sustainability leaders to share some solutions that we think will work really well in islands, Solar Spell and Pono Homes. And I think what we've all recognized through this incredible, incredible exchange, and thank you, my heart is full, everybody, is just how much we are nourished by the example of other amazing women sustainability leaders. And I want to personally give out a, a shout out to a role model of mine, Julie Wrigley, who is a global influencer, change maker, aggregator, whom I met by chance and really changed my life trajectory and is why I'm here in Hawaii now. Julie founded the Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability at ASU back in 2003. It was the first in the world. And she did, as Megan did, and gave away power, has helped over 400 other institutes since. And now, now we realize that sustainability is not sufficient. And that word regenerative and regenerative futures based on island and indigenous wisdom kept coming. So next week, we're thrilled that Michael Crow, who is the president at ASU and a great supporter of regenerative and female-led solutions, is going to be speaking at the closing session of this incredible incredible series that Austin and his team have put on. So I want to thank all of you wonderful women leaders and sustainability solutionaries who joined us today, the amazing participants who have been so active in the chat box, to Dr. Austin Shelton and his amazing team as real role models of inclusive and participatory leadership. And to say a big mahalo nui loa, thank you so much everybody. And we very much look to hoping for those who can stay on, continuing on in the virtual reception. Thank you, Governor, and thank you so much, Vice Provost, also for your Provost and, and Vice President for your wisdom as well. If you didn't have a role model before today, I'm sure you have at least several now. And while we're doing shout outs, let's use the chat to give shout outs to our favorite women owned businesses, big and small. Support local and support women businesses. So feel free to keep typing in the chat while I ask you three closing poll questions. First poll question. How much do you agree with the following statement? Women business leaders make a significant contribution to a sustainable global future. Oop, one word got cut out, but is this supposed to say a sustainable global future? Strongly agree all the way to strongly disagree. I'll give you about five more seconds to answer this question. Strongly agree is at the top and disagree is at the bottom. Okay, closing the poll for this one. Almost 80% of everyone said that they strongly agree that women business leaders make a significant global contribution to a sustainable global future. That's great. Closing poll two, how much do you agree with the following statement? Programs and initiatives that give women knowledge and skills to lead are important to economic prosperity. And it goes from strongly agree at the top to strongly disagree at the bottom. And I'll give you about five more seconds to answer. Okay, closing the question for that. And nearly 90 of you strongly agree that programs and initiatives that give women knowledge and skills to lead are important to economic prosperity. Great. And last poll question of the day. How much do you agree with the following statement? 
I am more likely to support women businesses after today's session. Strongly agree at the top and strongly disagree at the bottom. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds. All right. 70% of you said you strongly agree that you will support women businesses after today's session. And 20% of you said you somewhat agree, which is still an agreement, which is great. Okay, thank you all for attending week six of the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. And thanks again to our partners and sponsors for helping make this virtual conference series possible. Now we'll transition to our 30 minute virtual networking reception with Holly Rustic, the president of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce and founder and owner of WeGo Consulting, and Vanessa Williams, attorney at law, advocate, and founding member of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce. And if you can't make it, we hope to see you for our final session in the series next week on building capacity to achieve a sustainable global future. This will be next Friday, Guam time from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And Thursday, if you're across the dateline. See Zuas Ma'asi and have a great day. Biba Island Sustainability and Biba UOG. Holly Rustic, and I'm president of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce, owner of WeGo Consultancy, host of the top-ranked uh, grant writing and funding podcast, and instructor at the University of Guam. I'm very excited to be with you all today, and I'm honored to be surrounded with all of you wonderful women and men. I see tons of men on the, on the call today as well, so it's really, really awesome. Hey, <laughs> I'm unmuted. Happy day, everyone. My name is Vanessa Williams. I'm a lawyer and the owner of the Law Office of Vanessa Williams. We're going on our 10th year this month. Um, as an advocate for business women and sustainable economic development, I'm so grateful and humbled to have learned from all these amazing aggregators and solution, uh, sustainability solutionaries and advocates you spoke, um, you heard speak earlier. Um, and I'm honored to share this time with you today. So I hope to you all stick around so we can learn from each other. Um, and as Maria said, either be a mentor or get a mentor. That's right, that's right, I love it. So we'll be your moderators for today's virtual networking session. And we're excited for a full discussion with all of you women and men on Women in Business Sustainable Solutionaries. Yeah, COVID-19 has forced us to physically distance ourselves, but as always, we adapt and we innovate, right? So we're so fortunate to be able to stay connected and grateful to UOG CIS to keep us connected um, with this virtual conference. And as we learned from this morning's opening, our islands are not isolated, and now more than ever, it's important for us to stay connected um, and connect with each other. Absolutely. And that's the purpose of this networking reception, of course, is to connect with each other. We hope to create this safe and fun space for us to share today, learn, support 
support one another and build on the inspiring talks that we just heard. We heard so many different lessons that we can incorporate, um, but how can we do that unless we actually talk, hash it out, brainstorm, and then execute? So we are going to explain how this is going to work, all right? So in a few minutes, we're going to open up the floor to you all. But first, just go ahead and turn on your videos, guys, that you know, you're out there so we can see your beautiful faces. It's so much better for interacting. Um, we're going to go ahead and just have this great happy hour, coffee hour, whatever your time zone may be, as we see we have people from Switzerland, New Zealand, all over the world coming in, all the islands. So please, uh, yeah, go ahead and turn on your videos. Yes, please, we wanna see your beautiful faces. So we're gonna help as moderators with a couple of questions and we'll call on participants to share to facilitate the discussion. We're asking that you keep your comments to about a minute so that we can have enough time to hear from everyone uh, or as many people as possible. Um, but first, we'll, we're gonna start with a couple of interactive questions that everyone can do at once in the chat box or on the video. Absolutely. So as Vanessa said, before we open the floor, we're going to get, begin with a couple of rapid fire questions for everyone. So you answer these questions by waving or giving a thumbs up in your video or typing your answers in the chat box. Awesome. So just to start this off, how many of you actually learned something from today's sessions with these wonderful women? Just give us a thumbs up, give us a wave, or go ahead and put it in the chat box. All right. Okay. Tell us by typing in the chat box where you're joining us from. Let's see where everybody's uh, viewing from. Suva, Fiji, Hawaii, South America, New Jersey, Florida, Kosarai, Chicago. <laughs> wow. Phoenix. Well, we got lots of. Wow, okay, awesome. So I love this, man. There's people from all over the world. This is really, really beautiful that you guys are all joining us today. I'm super excited. Um, so now we wanna go ahead and say wave um, if you are a woman in business. So if you own a business or if you're working in an executive level in a business, please just give a wave. You can do a little virtual um, emoji wave or you can wave physically at the, bottom, at the screen or you can put it in your chat box. All right. Excellent. Okay, now in the chat box, um, I want everyone to type a one word, or, well, their takeaway, it could be a one sentence takeaway or a quote from today's conference that really resonated with you. Regenerative, give power away. Yes, I love that one. Inclusion, mentor, self-reliance. Yes, I am full, my heart is full too. And my basket. Low volume, high value. That was good too, yep. Excellent. All right, so I love all these words. We want to talk about these more. I think a lot of you guys want to maybe expand a little bit on, on what you guys are putting in the chat box, because I think this is really important um, to take all these messages of what we learned now, discuss them. So we want to hear from you now. So you can go ahead and let us know um, that you want to speak. You can raise your hand virtually on Zoom, and we can call on you to unmute you and to share with this group. And when we call on you, please start by saying your name, where you're from, um, and you can share about the work that you're doing to create a more sustainable future. Um, and just keep in mind that we want to hear from as many people as possible. Oh, Holly, are you able to call on anyone? Sure, I think I can. Um, I got the. I got the tech part coming. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I have Chelsea Pono uh, from Chelsea Pono Homes. She wants to talk. Chelsea, are you on the call still? I am. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like Chelsea might have frozen. Um, yeah. Hopefully get her to reconnect. In the meantime, we have Sheila who would love to share. Sheila? Share. 
this guy. He, I just wanted to say, uh, basket, basket is totally full. Um, and I appreciate you guys putting this together. Coming from Hawaii, we hear it a lot, and we think we're on, we're the only ones doing stuff. But it's so great to see the whole world working on it, especially women filling their baskets and sharing. Uh, one of the things that I didn't get a little bit of, and I hope I get maybe next week. Uh, is education and education not of uh, youth but cakey meaning really young so th their minds are set I, uh, because we've been teaching them for 15 years about reduce reuse recycle and not about rethink and regeneration uh, so I can't wait for those artists to start being in their uh, whole circular type uh, thinking um, about regeneration from decisions on design to decisions on material choices. And I love, uh, I think it's Brianne, uh, Brianna or Brianne, uh, love the whole ethical way of doing business. And that kind of teaching has to start when they're young because right now our business schools are not teaching that. And so I, I, I applaud you and thank you very much for me sharing what I think. Appreciate it. Mahalo nuigo. That's fantastic, Sheila. I really love that uh, part because especially, you know, saying, uh, teaching the, the younger kids. Do you guys have certain programs then that do that in Hawaii? Um, we have a lot of programs that include youth. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I personally have not been exposed to uh, programs that teach circularity, uh, that teach rethink of design or being a circular and an innovator in regards to what Brianne is doing. Um, we've been teaching them to be consumers. And this is as an overarching. I've not been exposed to any program other than the one I tried to teach. And it was funny because the kids were fourth graders and we talked about innovative, circularity, design, making choices here. And I could not get them out of that. They kept on saying, but I reuse and I recycle. And I'm like, great for you, but can we redesign? And um, so it's ingrained and we haven't been thinking that I, as an innovator, can think about way, way into the material choices, you know, and people are like, oh, you can't change Coca-Cola. I'm like, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. I love that rethink because, and especially with the younger kids, that's where we see a lot of it. You know, my daughter, she's, um, she's eight. And I, I see she comes up with all these things with COVID-19 even going on. Well, can I do this? And it's like, it's amazing, right? So I love that rethink, especially with our kids, with our youth, and see how our futures can be. Thank you so much. That's amazing. I do want to say it has to be rethink about when we, from idea, right? From yeah. the idea. Because what's happening is they're rethinking from a consumer, well, I'm going to uh, well, I'm going to rethink the way I purchase. I'm not going to buy that plastic bottle, but we want to get rid of the plastic bottle so there's no choice to even have to refuse it. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. That's really good. That's, yeah, that's such a good point. Great. Thank you so much. And then I know we have um, Chelsea. I think was able to come back on the line. She's back on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This was such a great session before, and I'm glad we can um, we can talk now. And aloha from from Honolulu. And I'd love to share a little bit about um, about my business, Pono Home. So Pono in Hawaiian is essentially its integrity. So it we're a Hawaii-based small business, and we are a B Corp, um, founded in 2014, and we focus on energy efficiency. So our mission is to reduce energy and carbon footprints of Across Hawaii while supporting local jobs. So the service we offer is home energy audits and retrofits to Hawaii residents, So, which provides these tangible services and resources to actively reduce our environmental impact. So through the last number of years, I'm servicing over 14,000 homes. We reduce over 280 million gallons of water per year and um, approximately 16 million pounds of CO2 emissions annually. So 
it really adds up. And um, we, you know, we've seen the success of this model and people get excited about it. So we are actually looking to scale this to other states and other island nations to really help support local job creation. And this is through our um, home efficiency model. Um, I'll provide some, um, some links in the, in the chat for resources. We're currently um, piloting this in California. And um, I was inspired by um, Brianne at Ethique. Um, it actually, Pono Home expanded um, similar to that company to provide all natural organic products through a zero waste model. So we provide shampoo, conditioner, cleaning spray, and a number of other things um, for your home or beauty care. Um, and it's kind of the milkman model where you get bottles and you return them to us and we, we reuse them. So we don't have, uh, we don't have that terrible plastic waste. But um, our, essentially our goal is to really embody and encourage sustainable and value-based business practices and inspire other businesses to shift their models, mainly the, the big large ones. I think we've all seen here that the, the women-led small businesses are, are really where it's at. So appreciate being a part of this and um, I'll share some resources in the chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really agree. I mean, this is, I, I love that what you're doing. Like, wow, that's tremendous. Just the impact that you guys have had already. So that's really inspiring to see. So do you find um, as a, as a woman owned business, what kind of on a scale like that with renewable energy, has there been any kind of challenges that you have faced and how have you overcome that? You know, I think um, energy is, is, as we look across the different um, sustainability goals, social, economic, environmental, energy is really tangible and really easy for people to get on board with. So it's almost, I think of it like the, the gateway, um, the gateway to, into sustainability for some businesses that are going, eh, I don't know if that's, that's where we're at. But um, it's kind of a no-brainer when you look at both cost savings and creating local jobs and saving on environmental impact. So it really hits all those, all those corners. And I think people are um, sometimes surprised to see that it's um, women led, but I think we just need more wonderful examples like the women that we've mm -hmm. seen today. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey Holly, it looks like we have Monyeka from the Micronesia Climate Change Alliance who wants to share some exciting projects that they're working on here in Guam. Hi everyone, Hafide, thank you so much to UOGCIS and to all of you for being here. This is really great um, conversations. I work with the Micronesia Climate Change Alliance and at MCCA, we have a lot of really great projects going on and we're so inspired by everybody else's work. Uh, we have one, we just recently launched the um, Micronesia Precious Plastics Pilot Program. So we are collecting plastics number two and number five and repurposing them into beautiful things. Here on Guam alone, we produce 30 tons of trash every single day. And about 40% of that is recyclable or compostable. So it's really important that we start to uh, be creative and innovative with our waste. And this is the first time um, to our knowledge that in the entire region of Micronesia that plastics are being recycled right here from the plastics we consume. Uh, so that's one project we have. MCCA is also really excited to be launching a web series in July in um, collaboration with KUAM. We are gonna be discussing and looking into the possibilities and the need for more food sovereignty and food security for Guam and the Marianas. We currently are reliant on 90% of our food and imports. So it's a really dangerous situation given the global climate and given climate change. So food security, enhancing food, um, access to, to organic fruits and vegetables here on our island is really important for us as a community to start moving into. And we're also working with UOG CIS and the UOG Green Army to um, encourage our youth to participate in these sorts of actions and be more um, knowledgeable about climate justice and about ways to be um, empowered in this time. And we're really grateful and we're really welcoming to anyone who wants to be a part of the work. Just uh, message me. Awesome, thanks so much for sharing, Monyeka. I, uh, I, I think we have Stephanie Peterson. Is she still on the line from Solar Spell? Yes. Um. I'm here with my colleague, Corrine, and she's actually going to start our chat where um, tag teaming, <laughs> uh, chatting with you all. So I'll let her go first. So thank you. 
Hi, everyone. My name's oh. Karine. Um, and as Stephanie said, we're here um, representing the Solar Spell Initiative at Arizona State University. Uh, so our mission at Solar Spell is to empower learners globally by providing localized educational information and the training to build 21st century skills in offline environments. So in other words, we're increasing access to quality education in locations where there are barriers such as unreliable, cost prohibitive or non-existent access to the internet and electricity. Um, so how do we do that? We are providing a relevant education focused offline digital library. Um, and not only do we provide the device, but we match the technology with training to support the necessary development of internet ready skills. Uh, so the Solar Spell Library is a solar powered um, super portable offline learning library. Uh, I actually have the device here with me. There's a solar panel on the outside. Um, and we will share a video in the chat that explains all of these internal components here. Uh, so be sure to check that out afterwards. Uh, the, the device generates its own Wi-Fi hotspot to which any Wi-Fi enabled device can connect and freely serves the library's expansive open access content. And most importantly, we localize the content on the library to meet the unique information needs of each school or each community um, in which we work. So I'll pass it over to Stephanie to share a little bit more um, and then she'll follow up with some, some links and other information. So we've currently implemented projects in eight countries across the Pacific and East Africa in which we've carried out the training with local teachers, healthcare workers, Peace Corps volunteers, and we've um, actually deployed over 365 solar spell digital libraries to date. And in those countries, the infield partners, teachers, and Peace Corps volunteers um, that we train help maintain sustainable use of the solar spell. So it's not a just drop and go um, type of initiative. Um, so in addition to the training, uh, we also return after six months and a year to, to do impact evaluation so we can review the solar spell digital library use and get feedback from our users in the field. Um, and we really look forward to continue to expand our work around the world and share information with you all um, about how to learn more and stay connected with the Solar Spell Initiative at ESU. So thank you for having us. Thank you. That's so innovative. Um, I can see how that can work in so many places around the world, not just in really impoverished areas, but there's a lot of places that don't have the internet connectivity. And we saw that throughout COVID-19, especially with online learning, um, you know, students going into online learning that might not have those necessary components. So I can see how that could be so useful, such a great, innovative, practical um, resource. So thank you for sharing. All right, and we also have, we have um, Marsha, Martha, sorry, Martha Shaw. Martha, are you still online to share with us? Um, yes, hi. Hi. Uh, well, I was just gonna say hello. I, I was a part of the Social Venture Network way back when, when in the United States, the movement of ecopreneurs and I started Earth Advertising. I launched a company to, um, support that and B Corp was one of them. So I have just really enjoyed this talk and to see how far we've gone. And I want to get to know every single person there. I want to be a solar mama. <laughs> <laughs> so my company is earthadvertising.com. And I also want to direct you all to World Oceans Week. Um, that's starting on Sunday. I've been on the committee of the United Nations World Ocean Day and World Oceans Week. So you can go United Nations UN World Oceans Day. And I hope you'll find some nice programming next week. Uh, because we had the COVID, we were able to take it online and it's really kind of leveled the playing field and allowed so many more people to be represented. So. Mm -hmm. That's so inspirational. I love that all the work you're doing. So yes, we'll please share it in the chat too. Um, Oceans you know, Week is gonna be really big. I know there's a lot we can do to really um, focus on that, especially this year. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your work, Martha. All right. Um, also, Jane Flores. Jane Flores, uh, Guam uh, Women's Chamber of Commerce. And she's actually serving on the board. Are you on the call? I think you have something to also add to the, to the call today. Oh, I just uh, was, I had to step away for a little bit for another meeting, but I was really inspired by all of the great ideas. And I just want to note that I just gave Carlotta Leon Guerrero from a Judah Foundation 100 menstrual cups 
to Ooh. put into the Christmas drop because she's got a very um, uh, progressive health nurse in Ulithi. And so she's going to push the use of menstrual cups in the islands because I said, you know, Car, are we sure that, you know, we're going to drop these menstrual cups? Are these, you know, women going to know what to do? And she goes, yes, I've got it all lined up. So, so just pushing sustainability that way here on Guam and throughout Micronesia. So um, just keep those in mind, ladies. Great. And Jane, did you also want to talk a little bit about your end period poverty um, campaign? Yeah, and that um, we have, and what we're doing with that, because it was, it was something that was going really well in the schools, but now that school's not out, we had all of the, um, uh, we did a, a survey when I first came into office, we did a survey within the, our GDOE school system, because 100% of our students are on the free and reduced meal program, so we know there's a need, we know there's poverty in our public school system, and, and food stamps do not um, you can't buy menstrual products with food stamps. So, you know, the, the nurses told us that there's a need. The GDO, the officers in the, um, in the offices would tell us there's a need because girls would come missed, you have a pad, or they would have to go home because they didn't have anything and they started their period. And then we also did a, um, a survey at public health and we sent out 350 surveys to clients and we got um, I think 290 of them back, which is an overwhelming response. And the response about what these women use because they don't have menstrual products was huge. So we got a donation from period.org um, of 600 menstrual cups, but we also reached out to the women's chambers on the island because the government, you know, doesn't have any money yet. Although there is legislation, we did get them to introduce legislation to provide these products in the public schools, but we got the women's companies on island, they're the women's groups on island to adopt a school and twice a year, first semester and second semester of the school year, they donate menstrual products to the schools. We're trying to introduce menstrual cups, but there's a lot of cultural resistance to that. So we're giving them to public health and to the Ali shelter, to places like that. But, um, you know, also just trying to be able to have girls stay in school every day of the year. And um, because there is no school, we've got, uh, we're going to try to start handing out what we have. And then we've got uh, um, Glad Rags has given us a, a really good price on some reusable pads. So we're going to hand those out with the school meals once we get them those two for as long as we can just to introduce the concept of reusable pads to the island so that we can plant the seed with menstrual cups and with reusable pads so so doing that to be sustainable thanks Jane appreciate that yeah as we see there's so many different things to look at you know as we're moving forward and advancing women and those types of things that people might think not think about right as far as those mm -hmm. cause um, women to be, you know, marginalized even further. So I think that's really important work that everybody is doing out there and everybody is leading. Um, I know I was really inspired by the, the speakers myself and everyone here in the, in the virtual reception who has commented and all of your, your led businesses that are absolutely changing the world. All of you are change makers out there. It's really inspiring to see what's going on. Um, and I just, I can't wait to see how we can continue these conversations. Like I said, how we can actually execute, not just brainstorm and see how we can work together, but also how we can execute and we can implement for a better world. So Vanessa, would you like to say anything else before we close up or are there any last comments? Uh, no, it was just inspiring to hear about the work happening with everyone, our communities, our organizations, and the work around the world. Um, we're hoping that everyone can stay connected and collaborated with, uh, collaborate with some of the people you connected with today um, or that you heard from today. Um, and we think we can we can leave the chat open, the Zoom open for another 10 minutes or so for anyone who wants to stay, stick around for additional conversation or networking or um, type in the chat. Awesome. And yes, before you guys leave, please. Um, also, if we could grab a picture real quick, if you guys could all turn on your videos so we could grab a picture. Um, and I know CIS is organizing this. So thank you so much for um, doing the closing picture as well as the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce. We're able to support on this um, virtual conference today or reception. So I'll give it to the tech people.
Okay, we'll see. <laughs> just, just give them a second. Um, as, they're, as they're getting to the picture then, um, also, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to see how else we can stay connected um, on sharing these different initiatives. We just heard really snippets today of the wonderful work going on. And it was just like these teasers where I was like, I want to hear more. You know, it was really exciting. So I just, yeah, how else we can nurture this and we can really grow relationships. It's absolutely inspiring to see the work in New Zealand that's being done um, with Brianne as far as collaborating with different people all over the wor world to really promote this social entrepreneurship. Um, yes, earth advertising as well. Yeah, Martha, that was really exciting. Oh, LinkedIn group. Yeah, that would be a great one. Um, I, yeah, I, I imagine there could be, let's have the tech people of Miracle, you could share, there's a LinkedIn group where we can carry out conversations and develop relationships because I know there's like a hundred people, at least in this call that I want to like reach out to after <laughs> develop relationships with. <laughs> All right, well, hopefully they'll have the slide coming on in a second, but if not, if anyone else, does anyone else have something to share while we're waiting? Here we go. And there is a question, um, Maneka, yeah, the, the chat box. Um, you can save it now, personally, I know. If you click on it, you can push save, but I'm sure that CIS will also save the chat box um, as they close out the video, but you can save it personally as well. But that's a really good one, yeah, because you can really pull from all of these questions and conversations in the chat box, absolutely. Okay. Um, I saw they were working on it for a second. <laughs> I'm sure they're working on it right now, actually, but we just don't see it. But yeah, very encouraging. I think the chat box, yeah, that's definitely a way to connect with other people. Monica, actually, I have a question for you if you're on the call still right now. Oh, yeah, um, okay. about the plastics. Yeah, mm -hmm. the plastics, because I saw you guys, we've been promoting you guys on our social too, to be like, hey, they're recycling plastics again. Mm -hmm. You know, so can you tell us, is that all on Guam? Is there actually a plant being, or are you guys sending that off island, or how does that work? So we have machines, um, the precious plastics machine, and they're used throughout the world. Um, it was developed in Europe first, but we create things right here. So we've been able to do decorative things like coasters, and now we're, make, we're working on pots, um, planting pots, and uh, we have thing, molds for like Guam seal molds for magnets or little pendants and little turtles for paperweights or desk um, decorative pieces. So we're looking at getting more um, more molds for the island and maybe working with be, with businesses to, so they can sponsor a mold and we can take their plastics and really um, build this idea of the circular economy. That's absolutely gorgeous. I love it. <laughs> so I'm super excited about that. I can't wait to see where the products are, you know, we can even go in and look at how they're created and then also, you know, just promote what you guys are doing. Absolutely. So that, that's so amazing. Much, yeah, thank you. Hey guys, can we do one more uh, group photo? I realized that there were other people who turned on the camera. We might not have gone the second page. Yes. Okay. Okay, so one of us will be doing one page and another one of my coworkers will do the other page. So I'll count so us just down. Just tell us when. Right, yes. Smile. All right. Three, two, one. One more. One more. Three, two, one. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Phil. And yeah, so thank you very much for joining us today. And I hope we see you all next week um, at the next conference that CIS is doing. We're really excited about it. And this is a great time for us to come together. So thank you again. It's been my honor and my pleasure um, to be able to uh, co-host this today with uh, the beautiful Vanessa Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, everyone.